Today's video is sponsored by Shudder, the ultimate streaming service for horror and supernatural movies and series. Shudder's extensive library is filled to the brim with thousands of hours of chilling content, with new supernatural terrors, edge of your seat thrillers, and original titles being added on a weekly basis, guaranteeing that you'll never run out of creepy content to binge. Enjoying Shudder's treasure trove of new and classic content couldn't be easier. Their service gives you unlimited access to stream ad-free on all of your favourite devices, including iPhone, Apple TV, and Android devices. Simply download their app, or stream directly from their site. Recently, I've been using Shudder to not only discover some awesome hidden gems like The Invitation, a tense thriller that slowly builds up and makes you feel as paranoid as all of the characters, but also to rediscover some old favourites like Evil Dead 2 and the original Japanese Ring series, which I've been having trouble finding on other platforms. With a low subscription price of just $5.99 a month, or $56.99 a year, with Shudder it's never been easier or cheaper to fuel your nightmares. To try Shudder free for 30 days, head over to Shudder.com and use my promo code LAZY and get started streaming the best horror, thriller and supernatural content, all completely ad free. That's S-H-U-D-D-E-R.com and use promo code L-A-Z-Y and start your free month of spookiness today. So I've been thinking a lot about nostalgia recently. Specifically, nostalgia for the things that shape my love of horror. The old scares that sent tingles down my spine during my formative years. I wanted to discuss those dark gems in an upload, and I figured, what better way than with another iceberg? A childhood horror iceberg to be precise. But on this channel, we're not one, we're legion. So the twist this time is that most of the entries come from you, my viewers. Six months ago, I asked what media, concepts, or relatable experiences scared you all growing up and sparked within you your love of all things creepy. I've combed through the thousands of suggestions I received picked out some of the most interesting, included a few of my own choices, and somehow whittled things down to a manageable number of entries, spread across six tiers, with the mildest content at the top, and the most mind-shattering at the bottom. I had to be ruthless with what I kept and what I cut, so don't be surprised if this video's missing some obvious inclusions like Salad Fingers or Don't Hug Me I'm Scared. After all, this is more of a personal list that reflects what we, the Lazy Legion, carried with us into our adulthoods. The end result is a video that's half horror, half nostalgia trip. Even after all that pruning, we've still got a long video on our hands. So let's not waste any more time, and dive right in to Tier 1. Horror Movie Box Art When you were a kid browsing through Blockbuster or some other local video store with your mum and dad, there were always those movie covers that disturbed you a little, usually in the horror section. We're not talking trauma levels of Freaked Out of course, but I bet you can remember one or two boxes that gave off bad vibes. You didn't like looking at them, but for some reason, you always did, and you'd be left wondering what sinister thrills were contained on the tapes inside. I'm talking The Brain, Ghoulies, Evil Dead 2, Zombie 2, Jack Frost, and Silence of the Lambs. My dad actually owned a small video store when I was a kid, and sometimes I'd spend the day there with him. Personally, I always hated walking past American Psycho, this version of the cover specifically. Something about Patrick Bateman's pose and eye mask put me on edge. But even though it made me uncomfortable, there was something undeniably intriguing about it, like it was forbidden fruit. Now, as an adult, it's in my top 10 favourite movies, so maybe that feeling of dark curiosity was actually the awakening of the horror lover in me. The birth of Lazy Masquerade. With the advent of streaming and the death of movie stores, future generations will probably never get to experience this mild terror for themselves, and in a way, that's kinda sad. If you grew up walking through video store aisles, let me know which cover art spooked you. Wilkins Coffee Commercials. Here's one suggested by a few of my older viewers. Jim Henson is well known for being the legendary creator of The Muppets, as well as for his work on Sesame Street and other media. Some of his most iconic characters like Kermit, Miss Piggy, 
Fozzie Bear, Cookie Monster, and countless others have become household names, loved by millions across the globe. But The Muppets wasn't Jim's first gig. Before he hit it big with this iconic gang, he was more famous for creating these two characters. On the left, we have Wilkins, a sociopathic Kermit prototype, and on the right, Wonkins, his grumpy gumdrop companion. These early Muppets were used in an advertising campaign for Wilkins Coffee, and then later, several other brands as well. Jim's commercials were a huge success, and ended up helping propel his career. Throughout the late 50s and early 60s, he made more than 300 of these spots for Wilkins that aired throughout the daytime. Most followed the same setup. Wilkins would sing the praises of Wilkins Coffee, and Wilkins would say how he couldn't stand the stuff. In response, Wilkins would either intimidate, hurt, or sometimes even kill Wilkins before delivering a cold-hearted one-liner. There's nothing inherently scary about the ads per se, but I could see how the bluntness of them could be jarring. Not to mention, some of the things that Wilkins does to Wilkins are downright dark. He shoots him, clubs him, crushes him, electrocutes him, deletes him from existence. He literally just shivs him in this one. And in another, he's shown callously wiping blood from his rapier. Some learn, some don't. Don't think you'd get away with that in a commercial nowadays, even with puppets. Do you drink Wilkins coffee? Never. My friend, this is going to be the closest shave you've ever had. But even though some younger viewers may have been a little uncomfortable with the sudden display of violence in these ads, personally, I think they're brilliant. Not only are they creative and clever, but they were also really subversive for the time. In Jim Henson's own words, quote, Till then, advertising agencies believed that the hard sell was the only way to get their message over on TV. We took a very different approach. We tried to sell things by making people laugh. Well, your ad certainly gave me a good laugh, Jim. Even if they did upset a few developing minds in the process. But he would have liked the Wilkins. Unsolved mysteries and crime watch themes. I think most countries have at least one true crime show that could be described as an innocent stealer. The one that taught us that the world wasn't all strawberries and cream, and that there were real people out there committing the most heinous acts imaginable. Acts that hadn't even crossed our sweet little minds before. In my poll, US viewers frequently mentioned the show Unsolved Mysteries, whereas UK viewers brought up Crime Watch. The contents of these shows were horrifying enough, especially with those uncanny recreations. But it was those theme songs that really got under our skin. I don't know if it's just because they're intrinsically foreboding melodies, or because we all develop some sort of Pavlovian response to them, but something about them set a huge number of us on edge, and left us sleeping with the lights on. After all, you never knew who may be lurking in the shadows if you didn't. The Groak When you hear the word Moomin, you probably picture one of these lovable hippo troll creatures, or maybe the mischievous little Mai. What you don't immediately think of is something ripped straight from the pages of the childhood trauma playbook. Or maybe you do. One of the most popular requests for this iceberg was a character from the series, known as the Groke, a giant, ghostly figure with a wide grin, who freezes whatever she touches. Now the Moomins was adapted numerous times in various countries to suit different audiences. Finland, Poland, Japan, they all had their own original take on the Moomin family, and therefore their own unique version of the Groke too. In all of them, she's presented as an ominous figure that torments the titular characters. The Japanese version is probably the least frightening, with the character being more of a mild nuisance than anything else. The Finnish version had a darker take, incorporating a lot more shadows. The creepiest iteration of the Groke, though, has to be from the Polish Fuzzy Felt adaptation. Its piercing red eyes and snarls were enough to creep out any young viewer. The character didn't make regular appearances in any of these versions, but for most kids, seeing the Groke once was more than enough. The tragedy, though, is that the Groke was never an evil character in any of these adaptations, and only ever pestered the Moomin family because she was desperate for friendship and warmth. According to the Moomin wiki, quote, The Groke is both a live representation of loneliness and a psychological depiction of very lonely people who have a hard time accepting and expressing love in the right way, 
making them seem cold and scary to others, which, in turn, only leads to more loneliness. Now that's some very heavy subtext for a kid's show. Kaidan Restaurant Known as Thriller Restaurant in English, this is a Japanese manga anthology created with a younger audience in mind. What I like about this series is its concept. It introduces readers to different urban legends from around the world, and features a myriad of folkloric characters, ranging from the tame to the unsettling. The books have been adapted into a live-action movie as well. I wish there was more content available like this that gently and age-appropriately introduces kids to the horror genre. As it stands, Kaidan Restaurant is just one of a few examples. Don't you believe it? Tom and Jerry has been a childhood staple for multiple generations, ever since it first broadcast in the 1940s. The quality of the animation still holds up to this day, and when you compare it to other cartoons that were made decades later, it just shows how much effort was put into it. In the show's 1944 episode, Mouse Trouble, Tom orders a book on how to catch mice. Standard T&J hijinks ensues. Despite following the book's advice, Jerry outsmarts Tom again and again, as we've come to expect. Halfway through the episode, however, Tom finally corners Jerry. His mouse manual tells him that a cornered mouse never fights. Encouraged, the cat darts behind the wall and goes in for the kill. Off screen, we hear a struggle. Then, Tom pokes his bruised and battered face around the corner, and in an unnatural, eerie voice, exclaims, no. As many have noted, this is like something out of a lost episode creepypasta. Most viewers had never heard Tom speak before, aside from his usual screams and wails, but they sounded nothing like this. And the phrase itself, it was like a warning aimed directly at the viewer. The whole thing just came completely out of the blue, and was so unexpected that it gave a lot of us goosebumps. The face, the reverb, the cadence, the suddenness. If there's such a thing as the uncanny valley for audio, don't you believe it makes the cut. Actually, I don't even think this was the last time they used that line in the show. No doubt the writers knew what they were doing, and wanted to unsettle all of their young viewers yet again. You know, for kicks. Sky falling. I'm not sure how relatable this one is, but hopefully some of you will know what I'm talking about. When you were a kid, did you ever lie down on the grass, or on a trampoline, and just stare directly up at the blue sky? And I mean really stare at it, with nothing else clouding your view, and no one distracting you. Just that wide expanse of empty sky filling your eyes, infinite and distant. It made you feel weird, right? Like you were small, or like the world wasn't even real, or like you just might start falling up into it. It was kind of a trippy feeling, like baby's first taste of existential dread. Not exactly scary, but definitely uncomfortable. E.T. I've seen an inordinate amount of people saying they were haunted by this pint-sized alien growing up. Some were put off by his bulging eyes and elongated neck. Others simply didn't like the thought of a strange being lurking in their backyards. This family-friendly blockbuster was a huge hit, and quickly became one of the best-selling VHS tapes in America. So it's actually no wonder so many of you report being traumatized by E.T. during your formative years. It's simply a numbers game. I'm sure if we took a poll now, the vast majority of you would actually say you found him quite adorable. Or you know, maybe not. Danger 1 When I was growing up, The Sims was all the rage. I have a very vivid memory of trying to track down the first game when it released in 2000, only to find that it was sold out in every store. I may have cried, but hey, I was a kid, as were the majority of players. So it's kind of strange the developers chose to include so many freaky little details in their game. Ghosts, clowns, killer hamsters, the Grim Reaper. There were droves of frightful characters and events that could spring up out of left field. But of all of them, the burglars were undoubtedly the creepiest. 
At random and rare intervals, an eerie message like this one would appear on your screen, completely without context. If your younger self was brave enough to keep playing, you'd eventually learn that the messages were warning you about a burglar. There you'd be, watching your sims sleep soundly in their beds, when the game would suddenly and automatically switch to the slowest speed setting. A burglar would appear on your property, and that unforgettable sting would play. A soundbite has no business being that unnerving. This unforgettable theme is called Danger One, and if you played The Sims when you were little, I guarantee it just triggered your fight or flight response. The underlying synth is like something out of Psycho, and those two piano notes, just a half step apart, create an atmosphere of tension and unease, reminiscent of the Jaws theme. The burglar's presence in this game was unwelcome for many reasons, from stealing your furniture to stealing your baby. But the music that announced his presence, that was what really got our hairs standing on end, and had plenty of us playing with the sound turned off. Oh, and don't even get me started on the bar music. Empty servers. There's something indescribably eerie about joining an empty server or realm in a game that's designed to be multiplayer. The most commonly cited examples tend to come from source games. Take RP Downtown version 2 for instance, where you can still hear the faint ambient noise of life all around you in an otherwise empty world. The town sounds alive, but there's nobody else around. You're alone on this map, but it doesn't feel like you are, and it doesn't feel like you should be either. The rumour that the map's creator took his own life and now haunts the game only adds to the eeriness. But although ghost stories are fun to share around, that uncomfortable sense of dread that we all felt wasn't paranormal. It was psychological, and many of us experienced it when we solo explored these lonely, liminal spaces. That impending feeling that you were only one step away from a jump scare at any given time. Japanese Sliding Doors And now for an entry suggested by my lovely wife, Lady Masquerade. It's very common for Japanese houses and apartments to have sliding doors as partitions between rooms. Many children who grow up in the country report feeling uneasy about them. Strange, seeing how none of my friends who grew up in Europe were scared of the doors in their houses. Perhaps that's because sliding doors are a much more present feature than western style doors are, usually taking the place of an entire wall. That makes the thought of a creature sticking its head out around the corner all the more imaginable. I guess in that sense, these doors play into people's fear of the unknown. That horrible feeling that something could be lurking on the other side, and that it just might start sliding the door open while you're facing it. Or worse, while you're not. Pompul Ogpilt. Apologies for my Norwegian with this one. This is an obscure entry suggested by subscriber Akabam. They wrote in saying, in the late 60s in Norway, there was a puppet TV show called Reparatoren... Eh? Reparatoren e Komme, mostly known as Pommel og Pilt. When I was little, my mum told me about it, and how it used to terrify her as a kid, so I searched it up. Big mistake. It's filmed in black and white, has absolutely no music, and the puppets are unsettling. One character that is by far the worst is Janitor Gorgon. He looks absolutely terrifying, has a deep, scratchy voice, and he would sometimes appear out of nowhere to stalk the two main characters. One of the creepiest kid shows I've ever seen. Worth checking out. That was an intriguing suggestion, so I did some digging and found the show online. Now as you could probably tell, I don't speak Norwegian, but it's clear there's nothing overtly terrifying about the plot lines. Although the lack of music and general ambience certainly gives the show a bit of a creepy vibe. There are long, drawn out moments of deafening silence, and plenty of black voids that the characters melt into. Those elements are eerie enough, but the puppet designs seem to be the thing that most kids were unnerved by. As Akabam said, Janitor Gorgon's model in particular stands out as being very weird. I mean, look at those soulless eyes. Wait, does he even have eyes? I can't really tell. 
And why is he always making those strange sounds, and trying to immobilize the two main characters? These were the questions that haunted the youngsters of Norway at the time. And frankly, I can see why. The Tooth Fairy So this one surprised me, but apparently, a lot of you were scared of the Tooth Fairy when you were little. I guess the prospect of a small, flying stranger entering your room and taking your teeth while you're sleeping can be frightening to some kids. As Ben M put it, Young me was convinced that fairies equal angels, and angels are dead people. Nothing like the thought of a dead person wanting to take my teeth. Actually, that's a point. What were these fairies supposed to be doing with all these teeth? Jolly Roger Bay If you were born in the late 80s or early 90s, then there's a good chance that Super Mario 64 was your first true love. With interesting zones, memorable encounters, and one of the most recognisable soundtracks of all time, the whole game is nostalgia incarnate. For the most part, all of the fun to be had in Mario 64 is innocent and child-friendly. That said, there are a few moments that stand out as jarring for younger players. Most infamously, that piano jump scare. More than that, however, a lot of players seem to agree that some parts of the game have an unusual, elegiac aura. Wet Dry Land, for example, is said to give many players a negative emotional response, though most can't seem to put their finger on why. The zone that sparked that feeling in me during my youth was Jolly Roger Bay. After jumping around green hills and snowy penguin-filled mountains, Jolly Roger Bay marked a noticeable change in atmosphere. That lonely quality of the surface, the deep and sprawling water beneath you, this nightmarish eel, Unagi, hiding in the abyss. Yeah, this guy suddenly appearing out of nowhere was enough to make any younger player exit the stage. But you'd still go back though, just to hear Da Da Docks one more time. And with that, we move on to Tier 2. Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark I'm sure most of you are familiar with this book series. For many, this was their gateway into the horror genre. The short stories inside were decent enough for young horror fans, but most people seem to agree that the artwork is what made them truly scary and memorable. The style was something truly different, and made the images appear less like drawings, and more like old, ethereal polaroids of cryptids from another dimension. One that numerous people mentioned was the illustration of the white wolf. Although personally, I think the most traumatising picture was the one that goes with the haunted house story. We've all come across this image at one point or another. Though, if you're lucky, you were already an adult when you first did. For the rest of us though, this face lived rent-free in our minds for quite some time. And for some of us, it's still a tenant. Intense Vanity Cards Production cards, or vanity cards as they're sometimes called, are those quick little logos that appear at the end of a show's credits. They're usually just a few seconds in length, often accompanied by a short little jingle or a random word or phrase. Not a doctor, shh, is a famous example. Although most production companies choose to keep things light and professional, a rare few take a different approach, and instead try to catch their viewers off guard. Take Top Pick for example, whose card begins with a woman screaming for her life. <coughs> or Earbooker Productions, whose logo is essentially just a jump scare that could legitimately give an epileptic a seizure. <coughs> or the Bid Company logo, whose creepy jingle plays over a particularly haunting terracotta warrior. I'm not sure if these vanity cards were designed to be memorable, or if their respective companies just wanted to freak people out for a laugh. But either way, a lot of us fell victim to them back when we were kids. Collateral damage, I suppose. Clowns For some, it started with a jack-in-the-box. For others, it was a birthday party gone wrong. And for the unluckiest amongst you, it was Tim Curry. But no matter where your cholerophobia stems from, one thing's for certain. Loads of you really hate clowns. 
This phobia sometimes extends to clown-adjacent characters too, such as mimes, jesters and harlequins, and it seems to affect more women than men. Psychologists believe it has something to do with ambivalence, mixed signals, the uncanny valley, and our natural disdain for concealed identities. That, and how these circus dwellers are often portrayed as evil in fiction, which only reinforces people's hatred of them. Of course, there's also the real-world example of Pogo the Clown, aka John Wayne Gacy, as well as the 2016 clown takeover that received heavy media coverage. What's interesting though, is that if you take children who have never been exposed to any creepy clown media before, and you put them in a doctor's waiting room with a clown picture hanging on the wall, the vast majority of their amygdalas, or fear centres, will light up. That seems to suggest that for many people, their fear of clowns wasn't learned, but developed in their minds naturally, without any external influence. A University of Sheffield study concluded that, quote, Clowns are universally disliked by children, and that's most likely because they're viewed as a threat in disguise. Ironic that their target audience are actually the people who dislike them the most. Melancuma One interesting quirk about Japan is that pretty much every city has their own unique mascot. Designed to drum up tourism, sell merchandise, and show off the best their region has to offer, these characters are almost always very kawaii, if a bit generic and uninspired. One mascot that bucks that trend is Yubari City's most famous resident, Melankuma. But when designing their character, Yubari didn't decide to go with something cutesy or historic or derivative like most cities. No. Instead, they went with this. Well, he definitely stands out amongst all the competition, that's for sure. This half-bear, half-melon hybrid became internationally famous thanks to the Abroad in Japan channel, and has since put Yubari on the map for countless tourists. So, against all odds, he's actually one of the most successful city mascots in the whole country. Even so, it's easy to see why so many of the local children aren't such a fan of his. Whenever there's a mascot parade or event, Melankuma's appearance is typically met with screams and tears from the unsuspecting young crowd. Totti, the story of a doll's house. This short-running stop-motion series aired on British TV in the mid-1980s, and, as its name implies, told the story of a figurine family living inside a Victorian doll's house. Despite being made specifically for very young children, the show had a particularly dark edge to it, and dealt with some extremely adult storylines and themes. In fact, the show was actually designed to help children process strong emotions and face difficult topics head-on. In the most shocking storyline of the series, a China doll named Marchpane is brought home to live with Totty and her ragtag family. The pristine Marchpane is incredibly snobbish, has a superiority complex, and loathes the inferior dolls she's now forced to live with, believing they should be her servants and not her equals. She tries to turn the family against each other, but when that fails, instead hatches a plan to kill them off. She traps Apple, the youngest member of the family, and starts a fire using a paraffin light, knowing full well that Apple's mother, Birdie, will try to save him, and that Birdie is made of a highly flammable material. Birdie does indeed save Apple, but goes up in flames before she can save herself. She's incinerated, right there on screen, gone from the series forever. Rather than suffer any consequences for her murderous actions, Marchpane is instead donated to a museum, where she gets to vainly enjoy the attention of all of her adoring visitors for the rest of her days. In this children's drama, the villain wins. The episode ends with the family consoling each other, and Totty solemnly remarking, Birdie did look beautiful in the flame. For most viewers, this was the first time they had ever encountered the concept of permadeath in a TV show, and it's actually quite interesting that a kids program was willing to handle something so heavy. Unfortunately, the majority of this episode has since become lost media, though it does still live on in the minds of those who are scarred by it. Sonder You may not be familiar with the word, but you definitely know the feeling it refers to. According to the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows, Sonder is, quote, 
The realization that each random passerby is living a life as vivid and complex as your own, populated with their own ambitions, friends, routines, worries, and inherited craziness. An epic story that continues invisibly around you, like an anthill sprawling deep underground, with elaborate passageways to thousands of other lives that you'll never know existed, in which you might appear only once, as an extra sipping coffee in the background, as a blur of traffic passing on the highway, as a lighted window at dusk. Yeah, at one point or another in your youth, you realized this for the first time, and it filled you with a strange sense of loneliness. Maybe even an existential sense of insignificance. In a world full of conscious, complex individuals, with lives just as deep and meaningful to them as yours is to you, do you really even matter? Maybe not. But then again, maybe they're all just empty shells, and you're the only one that's real at all. The Smiler This entry refers to a commercial that played on British TV back in 2013. The ad was for a new attraction at Alton Towers theme park called The Smiler, which to this day holds the world record for most inversions on a roller coaster. Younger viewers were caught off guard by the distorted faces of the riders. Their wide smiles were like something torn straight from Soundgarden's Black Hole Sun music video and really tap into the Uncanny Valley aesthetic. Not something most kids wanted to see in between their Saturday morning cartoons. But darker than the commercial itself was what happened after it aired. On June 2nd, 2015, a serious malfunction occurred on the Smiler, where a fully loaded train collided with an empty test cart. Five people were seriously injured, and the two passengers in the front seats needed to have their legs amputated. Despite that terrible incident, the ride is still in operation to this day. Sonic Drowning Music When it comes to spooky inclusions in the Sonic series, YouTubers tend to bring up the Fun is Infinite screen. And sure, that's a very out of place easter egg, what with Sonic's strangely altered face and the weird music and sound effects. But I think most people only know about this because of the internet, and didn't actually encounter it for themselves during their youth. What we all got to experience, however, was the drowning theme from Sonic 1. As our titular hedgehog runs out of breath underwater, this distressing piece of music plays to signal time is running out. Some have described it as anxiety in music form, and most people praise it for accurately capturing the feeling it represents. An increasingly desperate need for air. The fact that Sonic can't actually swim in this game only adds to that tension. Funnily enough, the reason he can't swim is because the head of Sega's Sonic team, Yuji Naka, mistakenly believed that hedgehogs weren't able to in real life. Hedgehog in the Fog From one hedgehog to another now. Set in a gloomy, desolate woodland, enshrouded in mist, this Russian animation tells the story of a hedgehog on a journey to visit his comrade, the bear cub. Along the way, he encounters several other creatures, most notably this bug-eyed owl who menacingly stalks behind him. All of these other animals materialize out of the thick fog, which is essentially a character in its own right, and represents the uncertain and confusing world we all have to venture into as we transition from our childhoods into adulthood. It's a wonderful piece of art, but very haunting nonetheless. Animatronics These creaking abominations were the bane of many a kid's existence back in their heyday. Even before Five Nights at Freddy's, they had a reputation for being creepy. Again, it's that whole human but not quite aesthetic at play. Now that the vast majority of them are run down and old, they're somehow even more uncanny. You can still find these anthropomorphic animal animatronics in restaurants like Showbiz Pizza and Chuck E. Cheese, but in spite of their smiles, they always seem to look sad, like they don't even want to be there anymore. Perhaps some maintenance is in order. Live action Wallace and Gromit Oh, good old Wallace and Gromit. This cheese-loving inventor and his good boy are the ultimate claymation icons, created by the legendary Nick Park of Aardman Animations. 
For decades, British television networks have aired their popular shorts, like The Wrong Trousers, and they even achieved international recognition with 2005's feature film Curse of the Were Rabbit. Back in 1995, comedian Lenny Henry created a live-action parody of the animated duo for his Christmas special. The skit, titled The Right Trousers, saw Henry suit up and take on both roles. The results were… cursed. Although the sketch was played for laughs, there's no way the people involved didn't realise how off these costumes were. Henry's eyes seem overly human compared with the cartoony foam bodies he's inside, making it appear as if the suits themselves are possessed and have come to life. They kind of remind me of those cheesy creepypastas, the ones that use the hyper-realistic eyes cliché. And, as one commenter put it, poor Gromit looks like he's the living embodiment of I have no mouth but I must scream. Unsurprisingly, many young viewers were left feeling uncomfortable after this skit aired, and parents were concerned that this was a test pilot for a live-action series. Thankfully, that wasn't the case, and Wallace and Gromit have only appeared in their clay forms ever since. Kurushi When I was a kid, I was terrified of bottomless pits. The idea that you could fall into a hole and continue to fall for eternity filled me with dread. For some folks it's quicksand, for me, unending falls into nothingness. Kurushi, otherwise known as Intelligent Cube, really played into that beer. You take on the role of a very tiny man, fighting to survive against rows of giant cubes using only his wits. All the action takes place in a vast black expanse, with nothing but oppressive music and sound effects to keep you company, reminding you of just how small, fragile, and insignificant your character is. There's nothing scary about the gameplay per se, it is a puzzle game with PS1 graphics after all. Instead, the real horror comes when you mess up with said gameplay and are met with this game over screen. This death screen has always haunted me. You can really hear the terror in your character's echoey scream as he falls into the empty black void and is swallowed up by the abyss, never to return. Got me every time. Now let's dive deeper to tier 3. Undin Here's one suggested by my Filipino viewers. Shake, Rattle and Roll is a popular and long-running film franchise from the Philippines that blends horror with comedy. To date, 15 of these Pinoy classics have been released. The series' third instalment from 1991 is an anthology film which tells three separate stories. In the film's final chapter, Nene, a group of students are slowly killed off by the Yundin, a sea-dwelling creature whose acid spit can melt humans to the bone. The Yundin's frog-like design isn't anything too frightening, but its actions are what really troubled the film's younger viewers. In one sequence, the Yundin emerges from a toilet and literally dissolves a female student until there's nothing of her left but her slippers. It then uses toilet water to wash her bubbling juices down the drain, deleting every last trace of her as if she never existed at all. This scene, amongst others, scared the life out of thousands of Filipino kids and left them anxious every time they went to use the bathroom. For all they knew, this little monstrosity could be living inside their porcelain throne, waiting to melt them as soon as they sat down. Despierta, Chile se está quemando. This environmental campaign, which translates to Wake up, Chile is burning, aired on Chilean TV networks in the mid-90s. Created by CONAF, the National Forest Corporation, the spots were designed to raise awareness about forest fires and featured disturbing imagery set against a backdrop of a blazing inferno. The soundscape is just as chilling as the visuals, made up of weird electronic notes, screams of agony, and indecipherable chanting. If CONAF were trying to make their campaign memorable, then they certainly achieved their goal, since people are still talking about these spots to this very day. Though admittedly, they're usually reminiscing about their collective trauma and not discussing environmental activism. Ah! Ah! 
thriller music video ending. Let me set the mood. You're a kid, and you're at home watching TV. Maybe with a sibling, maybe with a friend, probably by yourself. Michael Jackson's the biggest star in the world, and he's just released a new music video for his single, Thriller. It's the talk of the town. Everyone's saying it's the best music video ever made, or like a mini-movie or something. You switch over to MTV, and the video's just starting. You know it's horror-themed, so you're ready for some spooky visuals. But this is a pop music video, so you're not expecting The Exorcist or anything. You sit through it, and it's a bit creepy, sure. But the choreography rocks, the song's amazing, and you feel like you're watching a huge moment in music history. Then, you get to the end. Michael's date wakes up from her slumber, revealing that all of the undead creatures in the video were just figments of her imagination. The story's over. Or so you think. Michael arrives to lift the tension, to sweep the girl off her feet and end things on a romantic note. Very wholesome. Come on, I'll take you home, he says, and the pair walk off side by side. Then, with no musical sting and no pre-warning, this happens. Vincent Price's laugh echoes in the background, and the credits roll. Needless to say, a lot of MJ's younger fans at the time had that demonic face etched into their minds, and still remember the fright it gave them all those years ago. Game Boy Camera Faces In 1998, a quirky little camera accessory was released for the original Game Boy. But hidden within its software were arguably Nintendo's creepiest easter eggs. These bizarre black and white faces which could be uncovered by repeatedly selecting the Run option on one of the menu screens. The first few times you select Run, you'll be shown nothing but a grainy photo of Africa. But if you continue to select the same option again and again, then eventually, one of these distorted characters will appear, accompanied by an ominous sound effect, and the text, Who are you running from? On even rarer occasions, these faces won't even let you return to the select screen, and will instead taunt you. It seems strange to many fans that these warped faces of complete strangers were popping up on their Game Boys for no discernible reason. They were probably just included as a joke by Nintendo, but I can assure you, their young player base wasn't laughing. Are you afraid of the dark? Submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society, I think this show has to be featured on this iceberg. Are You Afraid of the Dark was a Canadian horror anthology series produced by YTV, aimed at viewers who were, quote, old enough to stay up, but not old enough to stay out. Sure, a lot of the acting was cheesy, and some of the episodes really missed the mark with the spooks. But every so often, this show would throw some really terrifying imagery at you. Take for example, the tale of the dead man's float, the episode where a kid gets in a swimming pool to overcome his fear of drowning, and then this corpse man emerges and tries to drag him down. It's a smart metaphor for overcoming your phobias, but more than that, it was just a damn good scare. Creepy pastas and no sleeps. The glory days of these internet horror stories may have long since passed, but let's be real. We all had that one type of creepypasta or no sleep story that fueled our nightmares back in the day. For some, it was the creepy image pastas, like Smile Dog or the Russian Sleep Experiment. For others, it was the lost media stories, like Candle Cove or Where Bad Kids Go. And for a few, it was the obscure but excellently written tales, like Blue Light, Hellwater, or My Dead Girlfriend Keeps Messaging Me on Facebook. Looking back, most of the popular creepypastas and no-sleeps were far more goofy than scary, but a few of them do still hold up, especially the conceptual ones that deal with existential fears. Zeke the Plumber Despite only running for 23 episodes, Salute Your Shorts is considered something of a cult classic from the glory days of Nickelodeon, debuting just one month before other beloved programs like The Rugrats, Doug, and Ren and Stimpy. 
But despite being a light-hearted comedy, Season 1's Halloween episode, titled The Ghost Story, was remarkably scary for the time. Most episodes revolved around the main cast's life at summer camp and the shenanigans they'd get up to. So, when this Freddy Krueger-like antagonist appeared on screen, it was quite a glaring change of tone. This was Zeke the Plumber, a ghostly figure who, in life, had his nose bitten off and lost his sense of smell. While out digging, he hit a pipe, and, unable to smell the resulting gas leak, lit a match and blew himself to high heaven, losing both his skin and his life. The character Budnick explains to the group that whoever touches Zeke's plunger will be haunted by him in their dreams. Predictably, everyone touches it, and, one by one, they're visited by the skinless plumber. After being introduced to Zeke through a Resident Evil-style head turn, we get our first good look at his face, or should I say, horrifying human mask. Zeke's level of creepiness wasn't like anything we'd seen on Nickelodeon before, so, needless to say, he gave the majority of young viewers a shiver or two. I know who I'm going as this Halloween. Blind Madokan Does anyone remember the Oddworld series? You know, those games set on a dystopian world where industrial companies reign supreme and exploited workers are harvested and turned into fast food products. They were absolutely fantastic, but boy did they have a somber atmosphere. In them, you play as Abe, an extremely fragile Madokan who dies to just about everything in one hit. That aspect of the gameplay made the hostile enemies and environments you encountered all the more scary. But by far, the most unsettling thing about these games were the cutscenes. The worst of them all had to be the second cutscene from Abe's Exodus, which introduced players to the blind Madokan. Workers who have had their eyes literally sewn shut to prevent them from escaping. This second game in the series really didn't ease you in gently. I can appreciate this type of world building and dark aesthetic nowadays, but back when I was a wee lad, not so much. Lost Tapes When I asked you guys for your entry suggestions, this one came up a lot. Lost Tapes was a found footage mockumentary series that aired on Animal Planet of all places. If you tuned into the network in the late 2010s, you probably remember it. Each episode focused on a group of people that had disappeared while out in nature and the cryptid responsible for their vanishing. If you're not familiar with what a cryptid is, think Bigfoot, Skimwalkers, the Jersey Devil, basically any folkloric creature that the scientific community doesn't think exists, but that small groups of enthusiasts actually believe in. The show had a very Blair Witch-like aesthetic, with a jump scare thrown in every now and then. This was around the time that Animal Planet was having a midlife crisis and began broadcasting fake programs instead of sticking to purely educational content. But even though this was all new, no sane adult was going to believe that these were real documentaries. But if you happen to be a kid channel hopping, I can see how you could have been fooled by Lost Tapes. Conker's Bad Fur Day – The Spooky Chapter Like many youngsters in the early 2000s, Conker's Bad Fur Day was my absolute favourite game on the N64, even when it definitely shouldn't have been. With its quintessential rare art style and cast of adorable characters, many parents, mine included, assumed that this was a child-friendly game a la Banjo-Kazooie. Oh, how wrong they were. Despite its deceptively cuddly appearance, Bad Fur Day was actually a parody of Rare's other platformers, and of basically the entire N64 library. The game wasted no time spelling that out to the player either, what with Banjo's mounted head appearing on the start menu. That opening message wasn't lying. Conker was most certainly made for mature audiences only, and featured a lot of crass language, blood, and even a pair of sunflower jubblies. There was a certain rush you got from playing it, like you were doing something naughty behind your parents' back and getting away with it. That being said, there was one part of the game that may have had you run crying to mummy. The campaign chapter, ominously titled, Spooky. In this part of the game, the previously colourful world of Bad Fur Day suddenly turns a lot darker, both literally and figuratively. The chapter starts off with you stepping into a cemetery. 
Almost immediately, a group of grotesque zombies, complete with empty eye sockets and exposed bones, emerge from their graves. This was the first time that many young players had ever encountered a zombie of any kind in any medium, so you can imagine just how jarring this would have been. These shambling, undead squirrels were completely different from all of the previous enemies in the game, and before you even had time to figure out how the wonky aiming mechanics worked, they were all on top of you, their shuffle suddenly turning into a sprint that scared the life out of you. Those brave enough to venture on made it to Count Bachelor's mansion. The chapter comes to a head when Conker's transformed into a bat and forced to drop innocent villagers into a grinder so that Bachelor can feast on their juices. Bachelor eventually becomes too heavy to fly and falls into the meat grinder himself, allowing Conker to make his grand escape through a mansion filled with Ugh, more zombies. Unsurprisingly, this was the chapter where many young players called it quits and went to play something more age appropriate. Teeth for Two This entry refers to an infamous episode of the cartoon Cat Dog, a show about a conjoined, well, cat and dog. On the surface, it looked like a pretty innocuous program, so most parents felt comfortable leaving their little ones alone to watch it in peace. But the thing is, this show could become wildly inappropriate at times. The prime example of that is Teeth for Two. This episode is filled to the brim with gruesome visuals, on par with Ren and Stimpy, if not worse. At the start, the titular characters visit the dentist. They learn that whenever Cat brushes his teeth, Dog's teeth become clean, and vice versa. Only problem is, Dog refuses to brush his teeth meaning that over the course of the episode, cats slowly decay. So, Cat decides to take matters into his own hands. After Dog falls asleep, Cat somehow crawls inside his own mouth and travels down the length of their connected body. All we viewers can do is watch on in horror as he bursts out of Dog's mouth alien style, his inside out form just a red mass of exposed muscles and veins. Not the type of imagery you wanted to see while eating your Saturday morning cereal. Johnny Quest 3D CGI had to go through a lot of growing pains to get where it is today. Though the technology first came out in the 1950s if you can believe it, it wouldn't be until the 70s that we'd see something resembling modern computer animation, polygons and all. Even then, the results were a little too rudimentary to fall into the uncanny valley. But just a couple of short decades later, that would all change. Back in 1996, when digital animation was still in its angsty, coming of age years, a new series aired on Cartoon Network's Toonami block called The Real Adventures of Johnny Quest. The show's gimmick was that it used a mix of traditional 2D animation and more modern CGI, which now had mainstream appeal thanks to the likes of Toy Story and those clunky PS1 cutscenes. The latter segments weren't the prettiest things to look at. The smooth textures, flat lighting and unnatural movements gave all the characters an eerie quality, some more than others, and the absolute worst offender was undoubtedly Medusa. This character petrified me as a child. I was only five or six when I first saw this, and it triggered something inside me. Her erratic flailing, her voice how she's always hot on Johnny's heels. For years, I had recurring nightmares about being chased by Medusa through a maze. Looking back for the first time now as an adult, the episode is actually sort of comical, what with all the janky animation and all. Funny how something so tame can get under a child's skin if seen at the right time. Had 3D animation technology been slightly better or slightly worse, I don't think it would have had nearly the same effect so this may end up being something only 90s kids can relate to. The Tar Pits The Land Before Time was certainly on the darker end of the children's entertainment spectrum. Exploring themes of death and loss, the movie didn't treat its audience like babies, though in the minds of some viewers, it did overstep the line once or twice. For little ones, it could be quite a stressful watch, largely because the characters were in near constant peril. But according to my poll, the hardest thing to sit through for you guys was the tar pit scene. 
Indeed, seeing your favourite characters being swallowed alive by a pool of black tar is quite a stark image. But as dark as that scene is, it doesn't compare to what was really going on behind the scenes of this movie. Specifically, with regards to Judith Eva Barsi, the young girl who voiced Ducky. Her father violently mistreated her, to the point where she developed compulsive behaviours such as plucking out her own eyelashes. She lived a tragically short and difficult life, and on the morning of July 27th, 1988, Judith's father killed her, her mother, and himself. She was only ten. And now we enter Tier 4, and we kick things off with Courage the Cowardly Dog. When it comes to horror, many of us cut our baby teeth on Courage the Cowardly Dog, the catalyst that sparked our love of ghoulish entertainment. It's strange to think that so many children tuned into Cartoon Network to watch what was in essence a psychological horror series, but that's just a testament to how incredible this show really was. Original, off the wall, and genuinely scary, almost every episode featured some sort of hellish entity that plagued our dreams. Freaky Fred, Spirit of the Harvest Moon, that one Barlingar, the list goes on and on. No wonder this show was the most suggested entry on my poll. But reading through your suggestions, two moments from Courage were continuously ranked above all of the others, and if you're familiar with the show, you can probably guess which ones. In second place was the infamous You're Not Perfect scene, from the episode aptly named Perfect. This scene appears completely out of the blue, and caught a lot of viewers, young and old, off guard. Nobody's completely sure what this bizarre fetus being is meant to be, a visual representation of Courage's insecurities perhaps, but whatever it is, it only ever appeared once in this short scene to deliver the ominous line, You're not perfect. You're not perfect. perfect. The CGI makes it appear eerily realistic compared to Courage, Eustace and Muriel, and it certainly came as a distressing surprise. The moment that took the top spot, however, was, of course, the return the slab scene from the episode King Ramsay's Curse. After Eustace gets his paws on the king's slab, Ramsay's ghostly apparition comes to demand it back. Again, King Ramsay's computer animation makes him stand out from all of the others. But unlike the blue creature, Ramsay's is animated over a 2D background, which only accentuates his disturbing appearance and movements. Even if you shut your eyes, his monotone voice, moaning, Return the slab, or suffer my curse, was left echoing in our heads well after the scene ended. Both of these scenes left a lasting impression on everyone who saw them, and are 100% responsible for millions of sleepless nights. Chrysar. Chrysar, or the rat catcher in English, is an ambitious 1986 Czechoslovakian fantasy film directed by Jiri Barta. It's a slightly alternate take on the famous Pied Piper legend, made using wooden puppets, stop motion animation, and zero dialogue. The results are beautifully macabre, and more than enough to unsettle any young audience member. After the grimy town of Hamlin is overrun by rats, a mysterious stranger offers to help its inhabitants for a sum of money. He uses his pipe to hypnotise all of the rodents, and has them launch themselves over a cliffside tower to their doom. When the leaders of the town refuse to pay the piper for his services, he angrily takes his leave, concluding that they're no better than the rats. But before he takes off, he goes to say goodbye to the only pure person in Hamlin, a woman he had met, whose character model is completely different from all of the others, pristine and innocent. The piper arrives at her home, only to find that she's been raped and murdered by a vile group of town drunks. Disgusted with the people of the town, the Piper makes a deal with Saturn to magically transform every citizen into a rat, the only exceptions being a baby and a fisherman. He leads these human rats to the highest tower, where they all meet the same fate as the other rodents before them. With visceral scenes of animal slaughter, twisted German expressionist scenery, and an overall morose atmosphere, 
This unrated film plagued the dreams of many European children throughout the 80s and 90s. It's certainly the darkest interpretation of the Pied Piper story I've ever come across, which probably makes it the most accurate too, seeing how the original tale didn't shy away from horrific details either. Although the story of the Pied Piper is a work of fiction, what's interesting is that it's probably based on a real historical event. If you visit the Pied Piper house in the real city of Hamelin, there's a medieval plaque that reads as follows. AD 1284 On the 26th of June, the day of St. John and St. Paul, 130 children, born in Hamelin, were led out of town by a piper wearing multicoloured clothes. After passing the Calvary by Koppenberg, they disappeared forever. Along with that plaque, there are multiple other pieces of evidence to suggest that something terrible did indeed happen to the children of Hamelin, and all of the sources use the exact same date, the 26th of June, 1284. The story of the Pied Piper began circulating shortly thereafter, though whether he was an actual real person or an allegory for something more abstract remains unknown. Perhaps the 130 children fell victim to dancing mania, or drowned in a river, or perished in a plague. Or, perhaps, there really was a man in pied clothing, who either recruited them, or led them into an ambush. The answer to this genuine historical mystery will likely never be known. But, aside from the magical elements, the story of the Pied Piper is probably rooted in more truth than most people realise. The Ambient Horror of Majora's Mask For a kid-friendly Nintendo series, The Legend of Zelda sure has a lot of unsettling moments scattered throughout it. Ocarina of Time was the fourth best-selling game on the N64, with over 7.5 million units sold. No wonder so many of you suggested Redeads as an entry for this iceberg. Though if you ask me, the miniboss Dead Hand was always more creepy. With his lifeless eyes, giant teeth, bloody torso, and long, spindly hands that burst from the floor, this guy was actual nightmare fuel. Worst of all, you had to fight him twice. Still, he was just one of a few uncomfortable enemies you had to face in a mostly cosy game. Majora's Mask, on the other hand, was an entirely different beast altogether. It's one of the most unnerving titles ever created, and it's not even a horror game. There aren't any jump scares or particularly chilling enemies to face. No. It's the game's foreboding atmosphere and tone that really get you. You might call it ambient horror. Thematically, Majora's Mask deals with some heavy subjects, such as a loss, the five stages of grief, and the acceptance of death. Story-wise, the world is ending, and mechanics-wise, that's expressed through a ticking clock that you're constantly rushing against. Speaking of which, the moon. That's what's rushing you. It's being dragged from the sky, and is set to crash into Termina in three days, decimating everything and everyone. Its stretched mouth and wide eyes make it horrible to even glance at. But the worst part is that it's always present, looking down and smiling, getting closer and closer, reminding you the end is nigh and pressuring you to succeed or else. The stakes couldn't be higher. And yet, strangely, all of the townspeople seem resigned to their fate, which is in keeping with the game's unusually depressing tone. The erratic mask salesman is another chilling presence that terrified many a young player, what with his sinister grimace and sudden mood swings. Then there's the infamous Ben Drown story attached to the game. I could go on and on, but those of you lucky enough to have played this masterpiece know exactly what I'm talking about. And those of you who haven't? Well, you've met with a terrible fate, haven't you? Superman 3 Robot Transformation If you were a kid in the 70s or 80s, you were probably a huge fan of Superman. For many a youngster, Superman 3 was the first time they ever got to see their hero on the big screen. Imagine how quickly their excitement dissipated when they saw this scene, in which a woman is turned into a cyborg with no soul. There's something especially twisted about seeing a person's humanity being ripped out of them in real time. 
The way this woman screams for help, only to be silenced by a piece of metal clamping her jaw shut. The close-up shot of her lifeless eyes that tells us she's no longer in there. The robotic way she moves. If this scene gave you fear-induced insomnia as a child, believe me, you really weren't alone. Just find a clip of it on YouTube and read through the comment section. I've never seen so many people on the internet agreeing with each other about something. The Coulsonian Jump Scare When it comes to genuinely scary moments in the Scooby-Doo franchise, Zombie Island usually takes the crown. But for this list, I'm going with the point-and-click flash game, Escape from the Coulsonian. By and large, this is a very mundane gaming experience that isn't very creepy at all. It probably would have fallen into the annals of obscurity had it not been for this one completely out of place jump scare. Brace yourselves. At one point in the game, you come to an Egyptian tomb. When you pry it open, everything goes black, and some very small text begins to scroll across the screen. It's intentionally hard to read, forcing the player to get closer to the monitor. Please, haven't much time. Someone coming. Need help before- As soon as that last word appears, this mummified face jumps out at you and screams at an ear-piercing volume. I know horror tends to be more effective when you least expect it, but this sort of thing is just cheap and has absolutely no business being in a Scooby-Doo game of all things. Surely they knew who their target audience was. I can only assume some bored and underpaid developer was trying to give us some trust issues with this one. Because if this wasn't just one sadistic guy's decision, then I have to ask, who greenlit this? The Dark Side of YouTube We're all familiar with the term, the dark side of YouTube, and I'd wager that you've all found yourself in it at one point or another. Outside of the community guidelines, Creators are free to upload whatever they want, and as a result, some pretty disturbing videos have sprung up over the years. Henry Eats, Cooking Idol, The Simpsons Couch Gag, I Feel Fantastic. I know I said at the start not to expect Salad Fingers or Don't Hug Me I'm Scared, but I guess I lied, because they definitely fit into this category too. The most successful of these videos tend to juxtapose kids media with horror taking symbols of innocence, like dolls, puppets, and well-known cartoon characters, and then corrupting them for our viewing pleasure, or for some, displeasure. The fact they use such symbols also makes it more likely that children will stumble upon this type of content accidentally. Nowadays, this type of content has been perfected by the likes of Meat Canyon, but freaky and outlandish videos have existed on YouTube since the very beginning and have fueled the nightmares of many a kid over the years. And with that charming jump scare, we move on to Tier 5. Silent Hill Although rated M for mature, a lot of us got to play this PlayStation 1 classic when we were kids, or at least got to watch our parents or older siblings play it. Although Silent Hill 2 is generally considered the superior game, it seems most of you guys were actually traumatised by the first instalment in Konami's psychological horror franchise. Drawing inspiration from the works of David Lynch, Dario Argento, and even Francis Bacon, Silent Hill thrusts the player into a surreal world akin to a lucid nightmare, where the line between reality and dream is blurred. The Thick Fog, which was actually a clever workaround for the PS1's rendering limitations, visually represents the haziness of the main character's mental state, and adds an oppressive atmosphere that leaves the player in a constant state of nervousness, wondering what creatures may be hiding in the mist around you. And then there were the enemies themselves. They were otherworldly, seriously threatening, and a manifestation of our deepest fears. The graphics in 1999 weren't the best, but these mobs were so well designed that your imagination could fill in the missing details and bring these nightmare creatures to life. From the parasitized doctor, who symbolizes Alice's fear of hospitals, to the grey child, who represents school bullying, they were all menacing in their own right. 
years have passed, game mechanics have developed, and graphics have become more sophisticated. But still, the original Silent Hill's legacy endures, and the countless moments that frightened us while playing it remain firmly lodged in our minds. Mature Horror Movies I understand this one's very broad, but surely this is an entry we can all relate to. Seeing an absolutely terrifying horror movie well before our minds were able to deal with them. When we were small, horror movies were like forbidden fruit. They were strictly off limits, but that only added to their mystique and made us want to watch them more, age ratings be damned. For most of us, our morbid curiosity was too strong to suppress. Either we caught a glimpse of one while someone else was watching it, or we went to a friend's house and secretly raided their dad's film stash, or we just stayed up late and put one on behind our parents' backs. No matter how we got our first taste, the results were the same for all of us. Nightmares and regrets. When you're young, even the tamest of scary movies can have a strong effect on you. But those of you unlucky enough to see a film with top-tier scares, well you likely never forgot the experience. Here are some of the examples you guys shared from your own experiences. The ending to Mario Barber's A Drop of Water segment in Black Sabbath. The clicking sound the woman makes in The Grudge. And Ralphie at the window in Salem's Lot. This one was rated PG. Crazy considering it had half of its viewers paranoid about opening their curtains for years. I suppose that's the thing with watching a horror movie when you're a kid. Doing so can lead to lasting fears and recurring nightmares that you carry with you well into your teens, and maybe even beyond. Is that mentally scarring or character building? I'll let you be the judge. The Maze Game Released in 2003, this prank flash game had a genius premise. You'd open it up on your browser and be met with these simple instructions. Test your skills. Try to reach the goal without touching the walls. How steady is your hand? Let's find out. Try and beat all four levels. Sound effects will help. Hmm, a puzzle game. All you had to do was navigate the little red dot from one end of the maze to the other without clipping the sides like a virtual buzzwire game. Each stage got more and more difficult, requiring more of your concentration. As you played, your friends would be egging you on, telling you how well you're doing, and how they'd never made it that far, yada yada. Then, on the third stage, just as you're about to squeeze the red dot through a narrow tunnel and get to the end zone, this image of Reagan McNeil from The Exorcist would suddenly fill your screen accompanied by extremely loud and distorted screaming. Videos of people pranking their friends with the shot game started going viral in 2006, and soon everybody started tricking their buddies with it. When the maze game was at the peak of its popularity, nobody was safe, not even children from their own parents. Then, after falling victim to it, you pass it on to your friends as well. It got us all once. Once. Kfi commercial. Pretty much the same deal as the maze game, the only difference here being that this jump scare aired on TV, so likely scared even more people. In 2004, a commercial for Kfi caffeine drinks made its debut in Germany, and has since given a mini heart attack to everyone on the planet. The ad lulls the viewer into a false sense of security, showing a car driving along a serene, winding hillside road as soothing windpipes gently play in the background. As the camera pans along the picturesque road, the car disappears behind some trees. Our brains anticipate the car to come out the other side, and signals for our eyes to focus on that part of the screen. The camera pans, but the car doesn't re-emerge. Instead, a decaying zombie jumps up from out of nowhere and makes the most chilling sound imaginable. This was just one of nine separate commercials that KV released as part of their Wide Awake campaign, all of them screamers, featuring either a zombie or a ghoul. The point of these jump scares was to make the viewer feel the same effect the caffeine would give them. 
Seeing how many people shared this commercial around to shock their friends, I suppose you could say that the marketing campaign was a great success. I mean, this is probably the most famous jump scare of all time. And then again, I don't think many people actually remember what these commercials were advertising, and only remember the jump it gave them. <sighs> Bong Chong Dong Ghost You may not remember the name, but I'm sure just looking at this image gave you flashbacks. This notorious South Korean webcomic warns you up front that you're in for a scary ride, and even warns pregnant women, the elderly, and those with weak hearts not to scroll through it. But even with that heads up, it still manages to be unexpectedly chilling. It tells the story of a high school girl, who, while on her way home, sees a strange woman walking just ahead of her. As the girl gets closer, she notices that the woman is dressed in pyjamas, and that her limbs are twisted at strange angles. She doesn't dare get any closer to her, and that's when the comic comes alive. This heart-pounding head twist caught all of us off guard when we first saw it. Whereas most jump scares come off pretty cheap, this one feels earned. It's well placed, perfectly executed, and since this was likely the first time most of us ever saw an interactive comic, had that novelty factor. The comic only gets more intense from that point, with an even more sudden jump scare moment. The story itself also gets more disturbing when it's revealed that this is the ghost of a mother who lost custody of her child and so took her own life. Now she wanders the streets, asking those who encounter her the question, where's my baby? Undoubtedly the scariest webcomic to ever gain widespread popularity it really does give the impression that the woman's about to reach through the screen. No doubt she returned to many people in the form of a sleep paralysis demon. That's okay, I wasn't planning on sleeping anyway. Inappropriate YouTube ads. Ever notice how a few years back, you'd be innocently watching a YouTube video only for an extremely weird and downright creepy ad to pop up? Half the time, they weren't even promoting a product there are even unverified reports of people receiving an interactive or live ad. If you happened to be alone when one of these started playing, the creepier ones could send you into a bit of a panic, wondering what the hell was going on. You don't see too many of these nowadays, but that sure was a mysterious period in YouTube's history. Who was paying for these ad placements, and why? PlayStation Ads for the past 27 years, PlayStation have employed a rather unorthodox marketing strategy. In order to differentiate themselves from their competition and target a more mature audience, the company have commissioned some truly baffling commercials that can only be described as… oh god, I'm not sure how to describe them. Human-alien hybrids, weird sound effects, sentient demonic doll babies, and no footage of any video games whatsoever. Do these scream PlayStation to you? I think the only thing screaming were the little kids who saw these spots on TV. But you have to hand it to Sony. These ads were definitely memorable, and they all had some deeper meanings under the surface, such as how this one, the most infamous, visually represents the difference between old toys and new, and how the PlayStation can elicit all types of emotions from their players. This other one was even directed by David Lynch. Even if little you wasn't mentally prepared to see these commercials, you have to respect the risks that Sony took as a company, and their unique approach to advertising. And now we move on to the final tier. The Abyss. Shoujo Tsubaki. Think of the most depraved subject matter a piece of media could explore. All of the sordid and repugnant images, scenarios, and characters that could be included. Well, whatever you just imagined, I guarantee it barely scratches the surface of what Shoujo Tsubaki covers. Known in English as Mr. Arashi's Amazing Freak Show, this manga, and later anime and live action film, was published in 1984, and tells the crude tale of Midori a twelve-year-old who's left orphaned after her mother is eaten alive by rats. 
she's taken in by Mr. Arashi, a circus owner who gets his rocks off by licking little boy's eyeballs and doing unspeakable things to them. The rest of his troupe is made up of other morally bankrupt characters, whose actions will, more than likely, leave you feeling nauseous. There's puppy squashing, surreal body horror, numerous scenes of rape, and hand-drawn cheese pizza. And that's only the tamer version of the manga if you can believe it. Understandably, many readers have a lot of issues with the illustrations in this manga, and some of the content inside makes me question whether it's actually legal to own in most countries. I've heard others say it has a very black market feel to it, which I can totally understand. And if I'm not mistaken, it actually was outlawed in its native Japan for a time. Just looking at the audience ratings tells you how polarizing and contentious this manga is. Half the readers seem to view it as an uncompromising piece of art, and the other half as tasteless filth that shouldn't exist. The 1992 anime adaptation was created by a single man, who poured all of his savings and five years of his life into the project. His vision for the movie was considered so grotesque that nobody else was willing to sponsor or help animate it. He eventually did finish the project after hand-drawing more than 5,000 sheets of animation. The film was heavily censored upon release, though original copies do still exist. PSAs The emotional impact of public service announcements varies wildly, so your mileage may vary with this depending on which ones you saw growing up. There were of course some softer PSAs that played before and after cartoons, which mostly kept their messages friendly and non-threatening. And if you do drugs, you go to hell before you die. Hmm, mostly. But this entry refers to the ones that had a darker and more serious tone. On the lighter end of that scale, Americans may remember this eerie news bumper. It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? Other networks had their own bulletin-style PSAs, such as Mexico's Canal 5, whose infamous missing person reports were actually aimed at children. Then there were the narrative-style PSAs. These could cover a range of topics. Some warned viewers about the dangers of certain substances. Others espoused the importance of staying safe at work or on the roads. Others raised awareness about more obscure issues that deserve more attention. Plenty of countries have their fair share of these, but in my experience, the most intensely visceral PSAs tend to come from the UK and Canada. I'm not sure why that is exactly. Maybe you can just get away with showing more in those countries. But whatever the case, they just tend to really hammer it in with the realistic depictions of whatever the PSA is informing us about, more so than anywhere else I'd say, and many of them air during the daytime, in between family-friendly shows. Having grown up in the UK, I saw a fair share of these during my childhood, and I can still picture them clearly in my mind to this day. I guess that means they were effective. Emergency Alert Systems Undeniably one of the scariest noises you can ever hear. The attention signal. The sound of imminent danger. Of hurricanes, earthquakes and enemy states that starts blaring out in the middle of the night when you least expect it. Created during the height of the Cold War, we all associate this sound with all-out nuclear war and other end-of-the-world scenarios. Its piercing, metallic tones are intentionally unignorable and instantly make you stop what you're doing, take notice, and follow instructions. It's so alarming, in fact, that a surprisingly large number of people actually suffer from EAS phobia, a fear of suddenly hearing this very sound. And this is particularly common in children and teens. Should you ever hear these chilling screeches, then chances are that it's just a station running a test. But that's not always the case. In a real-life situation, the attention signal will either be followed by a synthetic text-to-speech voice coming out of your TV or radio, or by capitalized text filling your phone screen. The latter has happened to me several times here in Japan, 
where our phones automatically start emitting emergency alerts whenever a tsunami or strong earthquake is on the way. Thankfully, natural disasters excluded, these alerts have almost always been false alarms. Think back to 2018 with the Hawaii false missile alert. Still, that doesn't stop them from being extremely terrifying for both children and adults. This concludes this test of the emergency broadcast system. Where the Dead Go to Die This is a 3D animated indie movie that really shouldn't be viewed by anybody, no matter their age. It was made by a man named Jimmy Screamerclaws, who credited his use of certain illicit substances for the film's visual style. Released in 2012, the film is split into three separate parts, which are all linked together by a demonic dog named Labby. The chapters are titled Tainted Milk, Liquid Memories, and The Mask That the Monsters Wear, and they're all designed to alarm, unease, and offend everyone. If you can think of something sickening, it's in there. I won't go into the plot, because frankly, most of the details are too hard to stomach, but I will admit that the aesthetic is visually striking. The reason this movie gets its own entry on this iceberg is because when it first released, it was actually unrated, meaning that a few of you were able to get your hands on a DVD copy. Omegle Ever wanted to talk with strangers from the comfort of your own home? Me neither. But that's exactly the kind of novelty that teens found entertaining in the early 2010s. Omegle's a website that pairs you with another random user from around the world and puts you in an anonymous one-on-one -on -one chat room together. Just one month after the site launched, it was getting about 150,000 page views a day. And that was in large part thanks to some popular YouTubers making videos about the site. Most of these YouTubers' viewers were impressionable children who began checking Omegle out for themselves in hopes of bumping into PewDiePie or Markiplier. Since most of the site's users were under 18, and since the vast majority of them used webcams, a large number of undesirables quickly infested the site. Any kids using the site almost certainly encountered things they really shouldn't have seen, from men exposing themselves on camera, to people streaming footage of snuff films, and everything in between. The site quickly devolved into a virtual Wild West, chaotic in every sense of the word. Omegle's own creator even expressed his own disappointment with how the site was utilised, especially during those early years. Run the Gauntlet and Friends The concept of a website dedicated to showcasing gore is disturbing, even for most adults. But to be exposed to that sort of content in your youth? That can leave a lasting impact on a developing mind and change your childhood completely. But those type of sites are out there, freely accessible to anyone, no matter their age. Named after a punishment from history, Run the Gauntlet is a not safe for life web series that challenges its viewers to watch 20 of the most disturbing videos on the net, with the content of each video getting progressively more extreme. If you can make it to the end without pausing or looking away, you're said to have run the gauntlet a sort of internet badge of honour. Examples of clips used in this challenge include the infamous Shovel Dog, Three Guys One Hammer, various snuff films, and other sickening raw footage. Rotten, LiveLeak, and Ogreish were other websites that featured the same type of shock videos, but presented them in a YouTube-like format, where you could pick and choose which clips you wanted to see, although some of the time you were just going off vague link text and playing a game of Lucky Dip with your lunch. But believe me, there were a lot more than just 20 videos and images to be discovered. These included cartel members skinning and chainsawing people alive, a man accidentally getting his head sliced off by a helicopter blade, the disturbing blonde photo that literally left people needing therapy, and all manner of other terrible things. These sites tried to justify their existence by claiming to be alternate news services that stood against censorship, but due to lawsuits, national crackdowns, and a multitude of other reasons, all three have since closed down. But although they're gone, the impact they left behind on people still persists. I received numerous messages from previous users, telling me they found these sites at a very young age, 
and that the footage they saw had a severe psychological effect on them. To this day, many people still have scenes from those videos flash up in their minds from time to time. Some things, after all, can't be unseen. Whether due to morbid curiosity, peer pressure, or an accidental misclick, many kids continue to stumble upon this kind of gruesome content, and end up witnessing the unforgettable. At best, this can result in them becoming desensitized to real-world horrors. At worst, it can lead to anxiety issues, and, of course, a complete destruction of their innocence. The world can be a dark place, and because of websites like these, some of us found that out much earlier than we should have. Realization of Mortality Think back to your carefree childhood, before stress and responsibilities. Heck, before you even encountered most entries on this iceberg. Back to when you were a pure and innocent drug rat without a worry in the world. Before your developing mind could even comprehend the concept of death. But then, one day, for no discernible reason at all, something changed. And for the first time, it clicked. This life thing. It doesn't go on forever. It ends. But what will happen to me? How long will I be here? And where will I go next? No doubt your loved ones tried to comfort you and told you not to worry, that it wouldn't be your turn for a very, very long time. But time stops for nobody, and it dawned on you that one day your clock would run out too, and that there's nothing you can do about it. And that concludes today's iceberg. I hope you enjoyed the ride. Before we wrap things up completely, I'd just like to say a big thank you to all of my supporters here on YouTube and over on Patreon, especially my biggest supporters. That one guy Thomas, Jesse Jug, Alex Greensall, Alicia Jaggles, Anya Yekaterina Faustov, Asia Mina, Azriel Warakai, Beatrice Matarazzo, Charlie Lackey, Chief Kochuake, Colin Monsma, Connor Lothan, Craig Polliner, Crawford K. McDonald, Expand On, Gina Valera, Grace Archie, Infamous Sempapi, Joshua Quintero, Larry Mattingly, Leonardo Martinez, M. May H., Mackenzie Griffin, Myra Lancaster, Monica Mendoza, Nadine, Natalie Escobedo, Peter Logdredge, Philip Wester, Procupidine Natter, Taylor and Monica Gruenk, The Only Dorita, Zane, Mrs. Avon Rankin, The Deck of Cards, TNS Mum, Punished Kratos, Nephus1988, and Lydia Glossley. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. Remember to smash that like button, or I'll smash you, and you'll be hearing from me again very soon. Until then, you all stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.